This week we're going to begin looking at functions, scopes, and closures. So let's go ahead and uh, create some lecture files. And I'm going to go ahead and start by saving a new file into my htdocs folder cis233w and I'll go ahead and make a week 3 folder. So new week 3. And inside of that I'll go ahead and put functions.html and I'll go ahead and get started on this one. So doc type html html head title functions and then we'll have a script tag source is functions.js And just in case I need one, link rel equals style sheet href equal functions.css. So that's my head. And then for now, the body will be empty. Close off the HTML. So there's my starter file. And then I'll also create and save functions.js in the same folder. Let's start with console.log hello functions. And one more for functions.css. So let's go ahead and load that into the web server. Um, I'm already running Apache, so I'll go localhost cis233w week3. There's my functions.html. And if I look at the console, I have hello functions. So let's go ahead and declare a function. And uh, the first version is a simple named function. So function named function. So we're using lower camel case for function names. And then there's a parameter list. And so parameter list has one or more parameters. So parameter one, parameter two, parameter three. And then inside of the function, I can refer to any of these parameters. So let's go ahead and load that. So now I should have a function defined called, what did I just call that? Named function. So there's my named function function. And uh, when I display the string for the function, I get the definition of the function. But this is actually an object here. And so if I do console.dir of named function, I see it's an object that has a bunch of properties. So there's an arguments property, and we'll see that in a second. There's a caller, so this is where the function got called from. Um, there's a length, which I think is the length of the parameter list, but I have to double check that. Um, functions have names. The prototype for this object is a generic object. And uh, there's also some scopes, and these are actually implementation dependent. So this will be different on different browsers. So let's go ahead and call that function. So I'll pass in three arguments to match the three parameters. And it logs the value of those three arguments. Now, in JavaScript, since JavaScript is a weakly typed language, I don't actually have to match the number of arguments to the number of parameters. So it's perfectly legal to just go ahead and say name function and pass in zero arguments, even though the function has three parameters. In which case, the parameter values inside the function are just undefined. Now, 
I can take a, advantage of that fact to set default values. So for example, if I want the default value of param1 to be a piece of text, for example, I can say param1 equal param1 or some default for param1. So now if param1 has a value, I've specified a value, then I'm going to get that value in param1. If it's undefined or an empty string or any other falsy value, then I'm going to end up with my default value. So let's do that for param2 as well. And param3 So now I have default values specified for all my parameters. And if I call named function with no, no arguments, I get the first default, the second default, and the third default. Now, the other thing that I can do is I can specify more parameters than the function is expecting. And this is useful for functions that take a variable number of parameters. So for example, let me go ahead and define a new function. Function make array, and it's going to take no parameters. But inside of this function, I have access to a property called arguments. So if I console dot log arguments and then load and call make array one two three I see that my arguments array has one two three here so these are um, uh, numerically indexed parameters on an object and the object has some more properties as well. So let me go ahead and go to sources and in functions.js I'm going to put a breakpoint right there so that I have access to arguments in the console. And then I'm going to go to the console and I'm going to call make array again. So now I'm stopped at the breakpoint and I can look at arguments. So I can access arguments like so. I can say arguments sub zero, one, and two. So I can access them just like they're an array. If I say arguments dot length, that shows me the number of arguments that are passed in. It ignores these properties here. And so I can, for, but, but the type of this is just an object. So it looks like an array, it behaves like an array in some ways, but it's not really an array. And this is important because a lot of the methods that are defined on arrays, like for example, slice, are not defined for arguments or map or for each, which we'll be seeing later this week. So none of these are defined for arguments because it's not really an array. Whereas arrays have slice methods and map methods and pop and so on. So lots of methods defined for arrays that aren't defined for arguments. So if I want to turn the arguments from arguments into an array, um, there are a couple of ways of doing that. And one way that I like that's fairly concise is like so, var a equals, so here's an array and it has a slice method, and then I'm going to call that on arguments. So then if I log a, let's go back to sources and continue, get rid of the breakpoint, 
reload and then I'm going to call make array. So now when I console.log a I get a real array that has all of the array methods. So like um, var let's go ahead and return that value and reload so var an array is make array and let's give it five arguments this time so now an array is an array with five elements and I can call any of the usual array methods on this. So for example, an array is that set of values and array dot push um, watermelon and then an array now has six items on it and then an array dot pop returns watermelon and also removes it from the array and then I can slice an array let's start from this 2 which is 0 1 so start from 1 and then let's go up to 2 3 which is apple so from 2 up to but not including apple so this should just be an array with 2 3 in it Oops, I need to call slice. Right, so that gives me 2 and 3. Or if I go 2, 3, 4, so that's up to cherry, I get 2, 3, 4. Um, or uh, any other array method is going to work here. Now, another thing you'll see commonly, and this isn't... Uh, particularly surprising, but I can also define a function called uh, takes an object and then it's just going to have one parameter, which is an object. But then this uh, object that it takes will have some specific property set on it. So for example, um, let's say uh, I'm passing in animal objects and so I want to set the sound to obj.sound or bark so I'm specifying a default property value here and then let's say color is obj.color or brown and type is equal to obj.type or dog and uh, let's say legs is obj dot legs or four a color type with legs legs and and sound sound Okay, and then I'll reload and call takes an object. So I'm going to pass in a, an um, object, an immediate object that's going to have, let's say type is cat and sound is meow. And I have to double quote those because they're just strings. There. So a brown cat with four legs and sound meow. 
or if I want to specify a color here, an orange cat, I should actually fix that code so it says an if this starts with a vowel, but whatever. An orange cat with four legs and sound meow, or if I just pass it in an empty object, I get all the defaults. So you'll see this particularly um, when we talk about jQuery UI and some of the other platforms, passing in an object that uh, has some but not all properties specified. Now, in addition to taking parameters and uh, um, handling optional and variable number parameters and so on, um, you can also return values. So function, let's say plus two, and it takes a number. And I'm going to return the value number plus two. So let's go ahead and call plus two of zero, and I get two. Plus two of two is four. Plus two of six is eight. Now, if I don't pass anything, I get not a number because it's trying to add two to undefined. So this would be a good opportunity to add an optional parameter. Um, I'm going to set number equal, and then here I'm going to use the ternary operator. So number equal 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 undefined question mark zero colon number. So in this case, if they haven't passed an argument in, then I'm going to set number to a default value 0. If they've passed in any number, including 0, they're going to get number. So reload. This time if I call plus 2 with no parameters, I get 2 back. Still works the same if I pass in a value. Now, if I pass in any other piece of text, like apple, it actually ends up doing string concatenation because I'm adding a string to a string. And if I pass in something that's neither a string nor a number, it converts this thing to a piece of text first. So to string, I get empty, something like so, when you convert an object to string, I have to put parens around it. There. So um, if it's a number, it's going to do addition. If it's undefined, it uses the default value 0. If it's anything else, it's going to convert it to a string first and then do string concatenation with the string to. Now there is one thing that's often handy that's sort of missing from the language which is the ability to return multiple values. So for example let's say I have a function return multiple and it has two parameters param1 and param2. Now returning param1 is easy. But how do I return both param1 and param2? Well, this doesn't work. So let's see what that does. What I end up with is just the second value. So anything that's the second value, that's what I end up returning. The reason is because um, comma separated list of statements are evaluated left to right and the return value from the list of statements is whatever the last one returned. And uh, so usually you're used to seeing a list of statements separated by semicolons with semicolons at the end, but in certain, some contexts like where a value is required, you can also give a list of statements that are separated by a comma. In which case, the, as I said, return value is going to be the last one in the list. So it's basically completely ignoring the value of param1 here for returning. Bottom line is that JavaScript will only let you return one value. 
So how do you get both values to come back? Well, there's a couple of ways of doing it, but this one is commonly used. So I'm going to return an object instead, and it's going to return two properties. So here's an object that I'm creating on the fly. It has a param1 attribute, which has whatever the value of param1 is, and a param2 attribute, which is whatever the value of param2 is. So reload. And now the return value is an object with two properties. So I can say var ret is return multiple one comma apple and then inside my code I can say ret dot param one or ret dot param two. So that's called boxing because I'm boxing the return values into one object and returning that one object. Now uh, if I wanted to turn this into something real, so let's say uh, um, let's say I wanted to have a div function and uh, here I want to return the, and I think this is called the quotient. So the quotient is going to be math.floor of param1 divided by param2. And then the remainder is going to be param1 mod param2. So here's uh, an example of where I might legitimately want to return two separate values. So return, and if I call var result is div, let's say five by two, I see that five divided by two is two with one as a remainder. Or let's try eight and three. So eight, three goes into eight two times with two left over. So boxing things into an object is fairly common in some platforms. You can also sometimes see boxing into an array. So here I'm just going to return an immediate array where the first value is whatever I want to return first, and the second value is whatever I want to return second. So this is boxing into an array, and if I set result to div283, there's my two return values. Or five, two, like so. So I generally prefer boxing into an object to boxing into an array personally, because when you box into an object, the properties are named. And so it's easier to tell exactly what's going on. So it's self-documenting in a way that boxing into an array isn't. When you box into an array, you're relying on the position of the return value um, to define what that return value means. So it's not as clear to me.